it in just a moment. All right, we'll go ahead and jump in as people continue to join us. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We're live with Nathaniel Rich and Amitav Ghosh discussing Second Nature, Scenes from a World Remade. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. And before we start, we do wanna thank all of you out there for joining us. We're really thankful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Nathaniel Rich is the author of Losing Earth, A Recent History, which received awards from the Society of Environmental Journalists and the American Institute of Physicists and was a finalist for the Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award and the novels King Zeno, Odds Against Tomorrow, and The Mayor's Tongue. He is a writer at large for the New York Times Magazine and a regular contributor to The Atlantic, Harper's, and the New York Review of Books. Rich lives in New Orleans. Moderating this evening is Amitav Ghosh, the author of the acclaimed and best-selling Ibis trilogy, which includes Sea of Poppies, shortlisted for the 2008 Man Booker Prize, River of Smoke, and Flood of Fire, all published by FSG. His other novels include The Circle of Reason, which won the Prix Medici Etanger, The Glass Palace, and most recently Gun Island. He was awarded the Padma Shri by the Indian government in 2007, and was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2009. He lives in India. In Second Nature, scenes from a world remade, ordinary people make desperate efforts to preserve their humanity in a world that seems increasingly alien. Their stories, obsessive, intimate, and deeply reported, point the way to a new kind of environmental literature in which dramatic narrative helps us to understand our place in a reality that resembles nothing human beings have known. What does it mean to live in an era of terrible responsibility? The question is no longer, how do we return to the world that we've lost, but rather, what world do we want to create in its place? On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Nathaniel Rich and Amitav Ghosh. Thank you both. Well, Thank you, Julia. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Politics and Prose is one of my favorite bookstores. It's just a great store. I've done a lot of events there and always enjoyed them. It's got a wonderful, uh, it's got wonderful readers, a wonderful audience. And it's a great pleasure also to be here today with Nathaniel Rich, whose work I've really admired for a long time and followed for a long time. And uh, it's wonderful to be presenting this book uh, a really remarkable book, another, uh, another of uh, Nathaniel's uh, remarkable books. So Nathaniel, I was wondering whether you'd like to start by doing a reading from your book. Sure, I, I'd be happy to. And I, I just wanted to add that it's, it's a total um, thrill for me to be here with Amitav. And, and I, I should say I've been following your career, I know, longer than you've been following mine because I, I wrote a paper on your novels in college. So, so it's especially um, in, in my, my intro to, I think, an early literature class. Um, and so it's, it's really exciting for me to, to have this chance to, to, to speak with you. And of course, Politics and Prose um, has the distinction, they might not know it, of, but of hosting uh, events for my last five books. So I feel very loyal and um, connected to, to the, the store and, and, and to the community there, which includes my grandmother, shout out to Anna Dell, and um, my, my DC publicist. And um, so, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll just read a couple pages from the introduction um, of Second Nature to, to give a sense of um, the, the scope of the book, um, the, the themes of the book. And um, it's, you know, it's the one, it's the one part of the book that's not a story, but it, it, it gives a sense of the the shape of it. <clears throat> what we still, in a flourish of misplaced nostalgia, call the natural world is gone, if ever it existed. 
Almost no rock, leaf, or cubic foot of air on earth has escaped our clumsy signature. As Diane Ackerman has written, it's as if aliens appeared with mega mallets and laser chisels and started resculpting every continent. We've turned the landscape into another form of architecture. We've made the planet our sandbox, end quote. No one has better articulated the incoherence of the nature ideal than the historian William Cronin in his transformational The Trouble with Wilderness or Getting Back to the Wrong Nature. Nature, he writes, quote, is quite profoundly a human creation. As we gaze into the mirror it holds up for us, we too easily imagine that what we behold is nature when in fact we see the reflection of our own unexamined longings and desires. The idealization of wilderness is not merely, sorry, this is me again now, not Cronin. The idealization of wilderness is not merely a myth, it's antagonistic to the aims of any environmentalist. For if in the future, something resembling wilderness is to survive, it will only be by, quote, the most vigilant and self-conscious management. Our most prized wilderness areas are already the beneficiaries of governmental regulation, political compromise, and the constant round of interventions euphemized as land management. Even the re rewilding movement, which preaches benign neglect to allow nature to recover at its own pace, acknowledges the need to meddle. Wilding, Isabella Tree's account of the transformation of her English estate into a nature refuge, details the installation of barbed wire, the importation of longhorn cattle and trapped deer, and generous applications of glyphosate. The engineer and the ecologist have been enemies from the cradle. Since its founding as a discipline in the 18th century, civil engineering has sought to bring an unruly planet to heel, flattening infelicities of grade and angle, simplifying rugged terrain into a planar grid, routinizing chaos. But in recent decades, a shift has begun. Engineers have designed buildings shaped like mountains to reduce their emissions, wind turbines that mimic whale fins to increase efficiency, bricks of bacteria that inhale carbon dioxide. They have achieved a more powerful control of nature through the imitation of nature. Ecologists, meanwhile, have accepted that a threatened ecosystem requires steady interventive care, as might any patient in critical condition. Two dovetailing observations by the novelist William Gibson describe the next chapter of this history. The first is hardened into platitude. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. The other is soul delay, the idea that during long distance flights, the human body travels faster than the spirit. The uneasy sensation of waiting for your soul to catch up is what we call jet lag. We now inhabit a similar lag, a nature lag. The future is already here, unevenly distributed. We recognize its hallmarks, rising sea levels, regular visitations of apocalyptic natural disasters, the forced migration of tens of millions, accelerating extinctions, coral bleaching, global pandemic. Also cultured meat, re-engineered coastlines, the reanimation of extinct species, bunny rabbits that grow fluorescent green. Our souls haven't caught up. Even in the most optimistic future available, we will profoundly reconfigure our fauna, flora, and genome. The results will be uncanny. It will be difficult to remember that they will be no more uncanny than our carpeting of the American Southwest with lush lawns transplanted from the shores of the Mediterranean. Our breast augmented chickens are taming of the world's most violent rivers. If our inventions seem eerie, it's only because we see in them a reflection of our desires. It's impossible to protect all that we mean by natural against the ravages of climate change, pollution, and psychopathic corporate greed unless we understand that the nature we fear losing is our own. What follows are stories of people who ask difficult questions about what it means to live in an era of terrible responsibility. In the first part, Crime Scene, a series of amateur detectives investigate crimes against nature. Confronted with the worst of humanity, they ask, who let it come to this? The stories in Season of Disbelief are about people whose fundamental understanding of the physical world is mocked by a new reality. When our land, food, and climate no longer resemble anything we've known, how do we avoid losing our humanity too? We are as gods and might as well get good at it, wrote Stuart Brand in the Whole Earth Catalog. He since revised us to, we are as gods and have to get good at it. We know what it looks like to be bad at it. Because we're not gods, but primates plagued by fear and hubris, impersonating divinities usually ends in humiliation. 
And as gods, artists and engineers navigate unintended consequences, ethical cul-de-sacs, and their own vanities as they struggle to create a more human future. The trajectory of our era, this era of soul delay, runs from naivete to shock, to horror, to anger, to resolve. There's no better avatar of this transformation than Robert Balot, a corporate defense lawyer who started as a man of DuPont's America and became a man of the future. And following from there is, is his story and the saga of uh, one man trying to take down the world's biggest chemical corporation. Thank you, Nathaniel. That, <clears throat> uh, that was great. And it really get, gets to the heart of your book. Uh, so Nathaniel, um, I've been uh, following your work for a long time. And one of the things that's really impressive about it is how well your pieces are reported, you know? The, uh, I mean, the care that you put into the reporting, how you bring, uh, you know, these many voices to life. And also, you know, as anyone who's ever done any reporting knows, the really important thing about reporting is, you know, uh, bringing huge amounts of information into a sort of tractable format. So do you want to talk about that a little bit, about uh, how, how you report, what got you interested in reporting? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think I, I, I figured out pretty early on, I mean, I really had to feel my way through the form. Um, and I, I figured out pretty early on that for, to write stories like the ones that I, I try to write, which are really narrative pieces um, where, you know, I'm not a character and it's um, intimate stories of people in their lives, you know, in confrontation with, with you know, major crises usually. Um, in order to tell the stories well, it's not enough just to have the, the facts of the events or to understand the science say, um, or the, you know, legal theory and all of that, which of course you also need, but uh, for, for it to work as a piece of writing, um, I feel that you need to have a, a really a heightened level of personal detail. Um, essentially, the, det the, the level of detail that you need in a novel, you know, for a novel, uh, you know, in writing a novel, I think uh, a lot of people don't think about this very much, but the, the burden of, of um, proof in a way uh, on the novelist is, is higher in, in a sense than um, even a reporter because you have to have enough detail that it feels authentic, that it, you create a world. And I, I feel like when I'm um, in, in the journalism I write, um, in order to create the same kind of um, narrative feel, um, I have to get a lot more than just, just the basic facts. And so I spend a lot of time, you know, asking people questions that they think are completely irrelevant to the story or taking notes about, you know, their houses, their manner, their, you know, things happening around them. Um, seemingly unrelated that I, I'm often in the I'm often in the position of having to explain, you know, don't worry, it's, um, you know, this is all part of the piece and so on. Um, so they don't think I'm just sort of prying. Um, but I figured out strategies to do that. And, and I feel like it's actually crucial. You know, I could, I could, if I'm missing a fact, I can always call somebody up or look something up, but it, it's the, the details of, you know, how people's behave, you know, the manifestations of someone's personality um, of a landscape, um, of a mood. Th those are the, the hard details that, I, I, that when I'm reporting, those are the ones I'm focusing on more than anything else. Oh, can't hear you. Hold on, I, I think you're muted, Amita. Uh, you're wonderful at it. Uh, you're, you're, you're just uh, so good at presenting uh, people as characters, as protagonists in your stories. Do you want to talk, to, uh, talk about how you got into this? I mean, what was it that sort of drew you into, uh, you know, narrative nonfiction as it were? Yeah, I mean, I, these stories, um, I mean, more generally, generally speaking, it's a way to get out in the world. It's a way to not have to to have some instant gratification. And, um, you know, a lot of these pieces began as magazine, stories began in different forms as magazine pieces. And um, I tend to take a long time to write a novel. And, I, you know, it, it, in that process, there's a lot of um, empty space that, that I find um, I, that I like to fill by getting out in the world, talking to people, leaving my house, having experiences. And, and I found that journalism is the best way to do that. Um, but the stories in this, 
collection, you know, when I started reporting some of them, some of them I started reporting, you know, nine or 10 years ago, um, the, the earliest probably. And at that point, I didn't know there was a, you know, a book here at all. And I couldn't really even articulate what I was writing about. But I, I found that I was drawn to stories that um, felt to me uncanny, I guess would be the word I would use, or weird or creepy, unsettling. Um, and, and for a long time, that was enough, really, you know, if, if I, there's something that I couldn't really resolve that, that disturbed me. I mean, an example is, you know, the, all along the, the, the um, Pacific coast, uh, the sea stars started dying. Nobody knew why they started not just dying. They started literally tearing themselves apart in this gruesome fashion. And everyone thought it was probably climate related, but no one could prove it. And, um, it took on there, there, it created this kind of panic. Um, and so, you know, that's a good example of something that feels uh, wrong in some way, and, and yet there's not a clear answer. And, um, you know, another example would be this uh, story of it's sort of like a white noise comes to the Los Angeles suburbs where there's this gas leak in northern Los Angeles that's one of the biggest climate disasters in, in the world. Um, producing enormous amounts of greenhouse gases uh, for the three months that it was um, gas was leaking out of this, this mountain uh, storage facility. And, and yet everybody in the community um, was not really concerned about the climate implications. They were just concerned whether it was giving them headaches and whether they were getting sick. And so there was, again, a kind of mass, um, uh, you know, in the, in the course of the reporting, they said the word hyster hysteria is not is no longer in favor, but there's a mass um, panic, I guess you could say. And, um, and yet the, and it was justified in a sense, but it wasn't, you know, the, the greater problem in a way is this climate disaster nobody was really talking about. So that's another example of something that just felt eerie um, and, and bizarre. And so I think, uh, you know, the, that quality, it, it took me a while and it took a lot of talking to experts and, um, you know, people on the ground in these places um, for me to, to, to learn the vocabulary or, or to, to figure out the right vocabulary um, to talk about these things. Um, and, but after a while, I realized that what, what these stories over and over again were reflecting some aspect of this, this transforming relationship um, with the natural world that we're experiencing now and, um, and a kind of terror at the, both at the degree that we've changed uh what we what we call nature and and also terror at the degree to which we now have the capacity to to further change it um you know whether for for good or or evil oh. sorry that's again one of the most striking things that you do i mean uh, you put together the science and the uncanniness of these events uh, I remember when your Los Angeles gas story first came out, I was just riveted by it. You know, it was such a powerful story. But, you know, I think in this book, really, it's the first uh, story which is just so powerful and just dark water. Uh, you know, the poisoning of the waters uh, of Delaware by uh, DuPont. And, uh, you know, I just recently read another book about DuPont's uh, involvement with Freon and all these really dangerous gases. Would you say that, uh, you know, DuPont really passes under the radar, whereas, uh, you know, what they've done in the world is just as bad or worse than fossil fuel companies? Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's, well, it's, and it's really the same. I mean, it's the same strategy that they, that they you know, it's, it's a, a combination of, um, you know, denial, 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 and, and then, um, cover up and, um, and then fight like hell in the courts um, and in public opinion using whatever disinformation they can muster um, to, to stop it. And, and yeah, it's, the, it's an incredible story. Um, the story of Rob Bellad is this, for people who aren't you know, familiar with this, it's, it's now a movie, um, which I recommend called Dark Waters. Um, and it, it's this corporate lawyer, a corporate defense lawyer, his job was to defend chemical companies um, at a very conservative, you know, re really a Republican, um, the Taft family's uh, law firm in, in uh, Cincinnati. Um, 
and and he gets this call out of the blue from from this cattle farmer um who says that dupont's been killing his cattle in west virginia and that they've been dumping some he he suspects they've been dumping some kind of hazardous waste uh into a creek that that runs through his property and that the cows after after drinking from the creeks have started to go mad and and murderous and um and have all kinds of health, you know, is, you know, catastrophic health issues. And Balat's ready to hang up on him when the the farmer says the name of Balat's grandmother. And it turns out they have this somewhat tenuous but personal cl- connection. Um, and Balat, as a child, used to used to visit this part of West Virginia to a neighbor's farm uh, to see his grandmother. And so, out of this this sort of nostalgia for this moment in his youth, Balat agrees to sort of take the case look into it, not suspecting anything's going to happen. And, and sure enough, what he discovers is really, I think it's not, it's not much of an overstatement to say it's one of the most sinister uh, corporate uh, conspiracy, you know, conspiratorial crimes in, in, in the 20, of the 20th century, which is that for, you know, more than 50 years, DuPont um, had been using a man-made chemical, PFOA, in the manufacture of Teflon pans and and a million other products that had sort of nonstick surfaces. Um, and all the while knowing that this chemical uh, was carcinogenic, caused all kinds of horrific health problems um, and never biodegraded. And so you can't really get it out of the atmosphere once it's once it's there. And, and so what Balat discovers is not only, uh, you know, he solves the farmer's case pretty quickly when he learns that in fact, yes, DuPont has been poisoning the cows, but he also then learns that it's, the whole the whole community in Parkersburg, West Virginia, um, the water is is been contaminated and the air has been contaminated, and so then he fights this in- incredible lawsuit on behalf of of thousands of community members, and then he realizes it's not just West Virginia uh, and Parkersburg; it's the whole world that this chemical is so pervasive and produced in such enormous quantities that it's now found um, in the blood of every living person just about on the planet. Um, it's been found in the blood of every animal that's been tested for it. Even, um, you know, albatrosses in the middle of the Pacific Ocean have, found, have been found uh, to have the stuff in their blood. And so ultimately, it's become part of our biological inheritance. We pass down the chemical um, generation to generation and passes through the umbilical cord. And so, you know, Balat, it, it, it essentially, but it, it took this insider, it took this corporate um, guy to to figure out how to um, unearth this this conspiracy and and he does but it's um you know it almost destroys him in the process. Oh my God, it's just such a chilling and a powerful story, that one. But uh, you know what that story has in common with several of the others in the book is that they're about lawyers and lawsuits. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. So, there's a few. Do you think uh, uh, that's a way forward? Yeah, I mean, I think I think given the politics in this country, um, you know, environmental activists and 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 lawyers have have um, seen that as the path forward because you know, getting massive political change. Um, has just been so difficult. I mean, and 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 there are so many barriers, structural barriers, putting aside just even the political barriers um, to the kind of massive reform that we we need on climate and so many of these issues. That that's in many ways, you know, a main subject of of my my last book, Losing Earth. Um, and uh, you know, I think I think you know, for me, the 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 scene that stands for for the impossibility or or the the scent, you know, this this sort of feel despair that I think we we feel about th- that is when Balot, um, you know, he keeps appealing to the West Virginia EPA to try to get them to do something, and he's sending them documentation of all of these horrible things Dupont's done, sending them all these you know water testing records and so on, and he starts to realize that the same, the people, the lawyers at EPA, at, at West Virginia EPA that he's sending to are the same lawyers that he was dealing with in DuPont, that they're just cycling back and forth, that it's the DuPont essentially is running West Virginia EPA in the same way that they run, they run every institution in Parkersburg. And, and so, you know, you get this sense of futility. And yet, you know, Balad is really this heroic figure because 
he's pressed on. I mean, he's now he's now fighting a lawsuit that is a class action on behalf of every one of us, every every American citizen um, against Dupont, and um, and he's you know continuing to fight this for the rest of his life. I mean, he feels to me in that way, um, you know that. He, he represents, I mean, I thought it was important to begin with that story because I feel like he represents, um, I, I'd like to hope, maybe it's flattering ourselves, but I'd like to hope like we, we each have some of Rob a lot in us in the sense that we, we have a moment, if you pay attention to these things at all, where one realizes that our, our views of um, the natural world, our assumptions about the way the world works, about the way politics work or, or um, you know, corporations work, um, have been, you know, naive and that things are so much worse and more, more severe than, than, you know, we were told to, to, to believe as, as children. And, and with that disillusionment, I think comes anger, comes frustration. Um, but you hope it also leads to resolve as it does in Balat. Um, you know, maybe not Balat quite levels of resolve, but, it, but it, it does seem like um, his story presents a path forward. Well, Yes. You know, one of the things I learned from your book is that DuPont uh, began as a supplier to the US military. Was it in the Civil War or around about then in the 19th century? And as you know, I mean, the world's biggest uh, user of fossil fuels, as well as the biggest polluter, is the DOD, the Department of Defense. But um, do you ever feel at all inclined to write about that as a subject, about how uh, actually what's driving uh, so much of this, uh, so much environmental damage is actually militarism? Yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a great point. I mean, I think it's the, there's a line, I, I often think of a line um, of, of yours from The Great Derangement, which I, actually, let me, here we go. I recommend this to all all viewers. Um, Thank you. Yes, and uh, it, it's just it's just it's just the best thing that I've read about um, climate change and, and literature. And and um, you have this point about how the 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 you know the convention the conventions of literature that we use. Um, and now I don't. I'm now anxious that I don't want to paraphrase you incorrectly. So I'll I'll, I'll ask you to to correct me. But. Um, that that the you know it's it's just the history of our society of imperialism and of militarization um, is is deeply enmeshed in the way that we tell stories and in, in the development of the literature, um, just as it's deeply enmeshed in our consumption of uh, carbon or our, our, our you know pr production of of carbon emissions and greenhouse gas um, emissions, and so that you do have this dovetailing. Um, sort of path you know of destruction uh, running through not only um you know the militarism and industrial development but even through um literary convention i, I think that's a really powerful idea and and um you know what i've really drawn on or what, what really what especially resonates with me is this um the feeling that that um the conventions that we have i think you're writing you know, more explicitly about novels and fiction, but I think the same is true, could be extended to nonfiction. I think that the conventions that we have that govern the way we write in nonfiction about environmental issues um, also feel pretty stale to me. And, and you know, they can be effective. I mean, I'm thinking to, to be more explicit, you know, I think, you know, we have good writing, we have good reported pieces about science, scientific developments. We have, you know, good reports about, politics. Um, there are a lot of, you know, memoiristic um, naturalist writers. Um, and there's a lot of first person journalism. You know, I went to see this disaster and this is what I saw. And I think all of those have, have an important role to play. But but where I felt there's a huge absence is in both the fiction and, and the nonfiction, frankly, is um, use of narrative and particularly intimate narrative, uh, immersive narrative, storytelling to take on some of these issues. And I, I feel that that's starting to change in the fiction as you've noted and, and we're seeing more and more sort of serious grappling with these issues in, in, in fiction. But I think the nonfiction is behind actually there. And I, I feel like that's where I've tried to 
address my my you know energies is is through um, trying to tell stories that are nonfiction stories, but 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 I hope deliver the same uh, have the same weight of a fictional um, grappling with some of these issues. Uh, I have to say that I don't agree with you there, uh, Nathaniel. I think the narrative nonfiction has more than kept pace with the fiction. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking also of Elizabeth Colbert's new book, you know, and both of you have a common concern, which is uh, uh, Louisiana and New Orleans and the areas around New Orleans. And you've written about this so powerfully uh, uh, in this book as well. So let me ask you something. Do you think uh, the drowning of the Louisiana marshes and essentially of New Orleans uh, is unstoppable now? Um, it's definitely unstoppable. Uh, the question is how, uh, how slow, how, how quickly it will happen. Um, you know, there is this headline. I mean, I live in New Orleans. There was a headline a few months ago that was, I think, literally was we're screwed um, in the Times Picayune. And it came from a, a serious coastal scientist at, at Tulane who, who studies these things. And, um, you know, we, we have a couple of problems here. It's not just the sea level rise, um, but it's the depletion of the, the coastal marsh south of, of New Orleans and the, the end of the uh, Mississippi River, um, the causes of which are, are multiple, but um, the main ones are the hemming in of the Mississippi River um, with levees, which was necessary to allow New Orleans to exist and, and to have it, you know, a third of, of the, the, the continent's agricultural trade um, made possible. But also, um, critically, the role of the oil and gas industry carving up the marsh for pipelines and uh, canals and so on. Um, and so there's this incredible effort now that that seems to not really, you know, I mean, Elizabeth's written about it well. There have been a few other national pieces about it in the last couple of years, but it's uh, I still am surprised by how little it's sort of penetrated into the public conversation that we essentially have the one of the world's, if not the world's largest climate change mitigation um, infrastructure projects, I guess, uh, happening here. And the idea is to use the power of the Mississippi River to rebuild the marsh by, by flooding it with um, sediment rich water. And what's fascinating about it, and this is a, sort of another good example of a kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a solution, but it, it's not a perfect solution, of course, um, is that they're, they're, they're trying, they don't talk about this, the, the engineers in the state, but they're trying to buy time. Um, they talk about saving the coast or rebuilding the coast what they're really trying to do is put enough land, man-made land um, back along the coast to give us a number of decades to retreat. Um, and so that's something that, you know, some of these experts at, at Tulane who study this independently will, will freely acknowledge. It's not something the state will ever say, but, but the goal is to buy time. And, and, you know, buying another 30, 40, 50 years is, is significant. That will impact a lot of people and it's um, it certainly beats the alternative. Um, but I, I tried to write about the, the, the very complicated um, moral calculus that goes into making these these enormous decisions that even in their even in the best case scenarios um, will still harm some smaller subset of people. Um, and so how you know how do we weigh those those calculations is is um, conversation that we're just beginning to have now. Well, what your piece suggests really is that at the time these enormous environmental interventions were made, uh, engineers really never even gave any thought to the unintended consequences. And what we see now is that engineering itself is just a story of unintended consequences. So if they're locked into even more engineering, what are going to be the unintended consequences of that? Well, we, we know there will be unintended consequences because there always are and they're not intended. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's a situation we see playing out all over the world where, you know, we have been victimized by, um, you know, the uh, hubris of our engineering, of, our, of a kind of you know, imperialistic view of, of 
man versus nature and, and, you know, taming nature, taming wilderness and shaping it um, to, to our benefits or our perceived benefits. And, and now we're feeling these gargantuan um, unintended consequences. And so, and yet, you know, the alternative is not doing anything. And, you know, if the alternative is not doing anything, then, then surely um, that's unacceptable as well. And so you have, um, these projects like the master plan that I think is, you know, they're doing everything they can do in good faith to try to make sure um, that it does the most good and does the least harm. Um, but what's fascinating to me about the Louisiana story, and I think you probably see this playing out in every other version of this story and will in, in the decades ahead, is that there's still some people who will, gen you know, je definitely be harmed. And in this case, it's at the least, it's the, um, the fishermen who live in, in Southern Plaquemines Parish, um, who are the people who uh, in some ways are most endangered by um, inaction because they're the ones who are living furthest down in the Delta. They've already had to lift their houses up 17 feet off the ground after you know, a series of, of hurricanes over the years. Um, they're not protected by levees in many cases. And, and yet they're the ones who are most against the plan. And the plan has almost unanimous support in, in, a, in this very red state. Um, and it's because they're worried about the short-term effects of flooding the Delta, flooding the swamps with uh, fresh water from the river. Um, and, you know, it's easy for me in New Orleans to say, well, surely we shouldn't let the survival of, you um, the city, you know, the city of New Orleans, uh, be imperiled by a handful of fishermen uh, in Plaquemines Parish, but it's, you know, they actually have a, they have strong moral standing, and it's, you know, it's another thing to go down to Plaquemines and ask them about it, as I as I have, um, and so I think, you know, and and it's not just their 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 um, their income, you know, uh, that they'll lose as the fish the fish that they um, they they fish down there uh, are wiped out, but it's also their communities, it's a way of life, it's a sense of dignity. There, there's all of these cultural um, ramifications there. And it's not always enough just to give them a check. You know, it's not, it's not so simple as that. And so um, it's not an argument to not, to not try to, sit, to protect the coast. Um, but I think we, we're only beginning to have these conversations. And um, Louisiana is especially interesting because in this regard, you know, for a state that's not necessarily thought of being a sort of avant-garde of, of anything in this regard, they, they are ahead of the conversation. They are having these, these very difficult conversations about, um, you know, how do we handle this well and what kind of values should be guiding us as we, as we embark on these massive interventions. That's interesting, but uh, you know we uh, we almost getting to the end of our conversation, and we must uh, start looking at the questions now. Uh, but one last question that I'd like to ask you is that you know the situation in uh, in Louisiana is not unlike what's happening uh, you know on the uh, Chesapeake uh, estuary, and one thing we see there is that it's the people who's uh, who are most threatened who are actually the most opposed uh, to any kind of uh, environmental regulation or, uh, you know, activism in relation to uh, global warming. Uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the reasons vary. I mean, in the case of, of Louisiana, although this is, a, this is a fairly, you know, conservative community politically, they're not, um, they're wide eyed about climate change. They're not denialists. Um, they want to save the marsh. They just don't want to save it using these methods. And um, even though the engineers and the scientists say that the other methods will be insufficient and will be wiped out um, by sea level rise and so on. And so, you know, they are really motivated by this. They're, they're in this question of short term and long term, you know, gain, which just bedevils us over and over again when we come to these these kinds of debates, because, um, you know, they say, don't tell me about 50 years from now. Tell me about my next paycheck. Um, and and I think you have to take that that seriously. Um, I, I think that sort of the larger the larger question um, where, you know, comes down in part to 
it's hard to know where to begin, but there, I think I think we do need a, a broader cu- a cultural conversation about these issues. I mean, I I I think like the the eeriness that that you know I described feeling about so many of these these issues, um, just the sense of uneasiness when presented either with some new horrific form of devastation or some new t- futuristic technology that intends to you know reconfigure everything for the best. Um, the, the, the eeriness has a lot to do with the fact that we haven't, that the, a lot of these stories haven't been told or they haven't been incorporated into the, our cultural, you know, our our public, public debate, public conversation. Um, it's obviously starting to change. Um, but I think until we tell some of these stories, until we, we talk about these things in greater depth and in, in a sort of in a more human way, and not just at the level of policy, um, and politics, I, I think it's hard to see major shifts in the way people um, see these issues. But but I think that I think it is starting to change. Um, but it I think it will take. Um, and uh, I mean, maybe this sounds naive, but I think it will take more storytelling at every level, not just in sort of narrative nonfiction and, and fiction, but I think in in you know the the way um, news stories are written and the way that public debate occurs in all of its forms. Um, and I think we all have some responsibility to uh, involve ourselves in that conversation. Well, thank you for that, Nat. Uh, I, you have some interesting questions here. So maybe I'll pass on some of the questions to you. One of them is, uh, what's the best reporting you've read on the pandemic? And are you planning on writing about it at all? That's a good question. Um, I'm not planning on writing about it at all because I feel like I've only read pandemic reporting for a year now and I became obsessed in, I remember in um, January, I think early January when there were just these reports from Wuhan, um, I was already, um, my, my mind was already going there on the, you know, the the wet markets and all of that. Um, the best reporting, I think, I've the there's a great publication called um, Stat that is um, science public policy reporting, and they've done a, I, th- I think a fantastic job uh, the whole way through um, reporting both um, you know details on the ground and also some of conveying some of these larger public health questions. Um, I don't know what comes to mind. I'm curious. Do you have a good answer to this, Amitabh? I'm, I, I just I feel like I'm so inundated with it. It's hard to isolate individual strands. No, I guess I've been reading just about the same things you've been reading. But uh, let me just add uh, a, a, a sort of uh, subsidiary question to that. Do you think uh, that the way the pandemic has played out holds any importance for the future and for how environmental impacts? and climate change impacts will play out? Yeah, I mean, I, one wonders, right? I, I think you have to assume there's a heightened sense of um, the, the intensity of the, the connections that we have with everybody else on the planet, um, you know, that something can spread around the world so quickly that, that all, I mean, I, I, just the feeling I, I remember having that I think is shared by you know, a lot of people of, uh, in March, I suppose, when the whole world stopped and you realized that the, this, this total cessation of life in your community was an experience that was being shared in just about every town and city in the whole world is really a shocking feeling um, that has, has really stayed with me. And so you hope that a sense of the, this you know, uh, commonality of human experience, of the sense of being linked to everybody else um, will have some effect and, you know, the way we think about climate, the way we think about carbon emissions and environmental regulation. But I don't, I don't also know. I mean, I, I've, I've read a lot about the 1918 flu and, you know, one of the, the most surprising things about that is that as soon as it was over, people s- seem to stop talking about it. Um, and, you know, and I've even started to wonder this year, you know, is, is how much of the, the roaring 20s and the euphoria of that period could actually be attributed to the, the flu, um, you know, being put behind them. And so I also feel something like that might be coming to a kind of just total counter reaction against vigilance. I couldn't agree more. I mean, really, 
Uh, people have tried to do, draw all kinds of hopeful messages out of the pandemic. And I think it's just a lot of Pollyannaism. Yeah. You know, if you walk out on the streets here in Brooklyn, I mean, you can see, uh, you know, it's going to come back. Yeah. <laughs> like a roaring breeze <laughs> again. You know? Oh, yeah. It's not, but it's, it does seem like that. Anyway, you have another question here, which is very interesting. Uh, do you think we have reached the point where nature should achieve the status of a, of a person endowed with its own rights? Yes, I think it should. I mean, there's been a legal, there, there've been a lot of legal efforts to do that um, in, in the US uh, and, and abroad, although I, I know less about the international efforts. I don't, maybe it's been more successful in other countries. Um, it hasn't really succeeded here, although I know there's a lot of things in, in process. Um, I also think it may not be necessary. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, you know, for a lot of the, these, these lawsuits, um, you know, they're very, they're, there are people to sue. There are Exxons and DuPonts uh, out there. There are governments that have failed, including our own, that have, have failed their responsibility. Um, and so I, I wonder to the extent to which we need to, would need to even, um, you know, sue on behalf of a, of a species. Although I'm sure there are, there are, I'm sure there are good examples where, where that would be important. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it hasn't helped, it, you know, I think already we have, there, there's apparatuses for, you know, trying to save endangered species and, and so on. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I mean, I believe in the principle, but I'm not sure if it, if it is necessary to achieve things that we can't achieve through the, the normal avenues. Uh, I think actually this is one of the most hopeful things that we see in the world today. Uh, you know, if you think of the no DAPL movement, movement uh, which actually succeeded, and it was really founded on, on an idea of the sacredness of place. And we've seen that repeatedly, many court victories in New Zealand, in, in India, uh, in, uh, but most of all, I think, in South America. Mm. We've seen repeated instances of this. And it's kind of interesting to me that courts have been willing to concede this idea of the sacred because, you know, <laughs> those judges in the court uh, to them, the idea of, uh, you know, a river being uh, their ancestor is probably completely outlandish. And yet they're willing to, uh, you know, rule on these issues. Uh, you know, if, or if you think of the Icelandic glacier that, uh, you know, had a funeral performed for it. Uh, I think this is actually one of the most, uh, look, the old bureaucratic speak, the old technocratic speak hasn't worked. And I think uh, a new language is necessary. So I... I do agree with this, uh, uh, with the sense of this question, you know. But anyway, you have another question here, which is, what was your favorite narrative to write in Second Nature and why? Oh, um, my favorite one is the story of Shin Kubota, uh, Mr. Immortal Jellyfish Man, who is a Japanese scientist in Shirahama, um, who studies a species called the Immortal Jellyfish. I'd, I'd read about it in passing um, and, and grew obsessed. And it's, it's basically a, a species that, that um, goes through the, its life cycle over and over again. Um, and you know, whether that makes it immor immortal is sort of a, a question, a semantic and biological question that there's some dispute about. But I, I, I started to interview some scientists about it and um, they kept saying, you need to talk to this, 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 this guy in, in Shirahama um, cause I would ask, you know, is there any, is there any practical application of, of this, whatever this, the species is doing to increase its lifespan? Is there any possible application for humanity? And, and most of them said, well, unlikely. Um, but Kubota said, um, right away, yes. And in fact, uh, we're, I'm going to isolate, you know, we're going through this species, we will become immortal. And so I went out to, to, to visit him and, um, it was really one of the most remarkable, um, experiences of my life and I spent a week with him in his lab um, and at karaoke bars he's an obsessive uh, karaoke singer and and he's a performer as well because he sees it as part of his mission not only to study the species but to instill a love of of nature uh, into children and to really everybody and he does it through song and he writes these ballads uh, about uh, the natural world and about the jellyfish and 
and he has this whole other persona where he dresses up as a, in the, as a jellyfish basically and and sings these ballads and um you know it was it was just a a joyous fascinating time and it was a, and a pleasure to write and um they were just really fun and and it it he sort of represents the most um it's a it's, it's not just a hopefulness but it's a sense of you know if we're going his insight is essentially it's it you know we don't deserve to take advantage of these technologies even if we are able to achieve something like increasing human longevity um we don't deserve it until we learn to live in harmony with the natural world um and you know we can't exploit it anymore and we can't exploit it for our gain until we respect it and i i found um that very beautiful and uh, you have another interesting question here uh, how do you see the changes in environmental thinking over past years uh, eg new materialism speculative realism dark ecology etc as to visualizing the future and meaningful strategies to move forward well so that's yeah i mean i think there's been the most dramatic shift um politically at least is has been this youth movement um that's a global movement that is striking not just for um the effect it's had and and the power of it um the political power that it's amassed in, in a relatively short amount of time but um you know you spoke about a new language i think they're really speaking a new language um uh, yeah. about these issues and and uh you know i think they have learned the lesson of the last you know decades um that it's not enough to simply um have a good argument for why we need to to change our ways why we need to pass climate policy um why we need to change the way we regulate chemicals and so on um you also have to you have to bring a, a sort of a moral element to bear um and so these um you know when you hear these these people speak often young people they're not just saying you know of course we should do this because it's the best policy they're saying i'm fearful of of my future i'm i'm worried about whether i can have children whether i should have children um and and they speak in 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 their moral condemnation for for leaders who have failed to address the problem and that strikes me as a really different tone um and in a more honest uh, way of speaking about these problems. And so that's that's been, for me, the biggest shift I've seen. Um, to these other, other strands of sort of uh, that, that, that the questioner referred to, I, I, I do think the imagination, um, the way people are imagining the future has, has also become more sophisticated and more complex and, um, and less sort of black and white. Uh, and that seems healthy to me too. Um, I don't always reach the same conclusions as these various strands, um, you know, some extremely fatalistic um, or, or nihilistic and, and others sort of more kind of a uh, kind of tech optimistic. But, um, but I think that kind of thinking is necessary to, to come at this from a lot of different uh, ways, I think, I think we just need to bring more imagination to it generally. So I, I've been um, hardened by that as well. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so here's another question. Uh, regarding the idea of nature having legal standing, your initial reading rightly problematized the idea of nature as always already engineered. So how would this impact nature as a legal entity? and its attendant rights. I don't know. I mean, that seems to wade into a legal territory that I feel less confident um, talking about. I mean, I think the insight that human beings are not um, separable from nature, uh, that, that insight goes back to, um, you know, Alexander von Humboldt and his acolytes. And that's, that's the, one of the original, the foundational thoughts of of eco ecological thinking, this idea that, you know, it's not man versus nature, but we're part of nature. And, and as a result, what we do um, has consequences that will, you know, and don't only affect 
forests, but affect uh, us, our species as well. Um, and so that um, insight seems central. I mean, and now that, uh, you know, we've reconfigured everything beyond the point of, of you know, any definition of nature. Um, yes, I, I, I see the question. It becomes this Ouroboros, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure how to resolve that legally, I, but I think it's, it's an accurate representation of, of where we're at. One of the things I loved about your book is that uh, you're the only writer I've ever known to use the word ouroboristic. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was really wonderful. Yeah. Nothing but, else uh, quite means that, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes, and it's such a wonderful image. So let me ask you a couple of questions now. One is what makes you optimistic and what makes you pessimistic? Well, I mean, I think in terms of, I guess, I, I mean, I tried, I'm both optimistic and pessimistic all the time. And I, 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 I if anything, I try to avoid the um, thinking in those terms because I feel like so much of, um, a, a lot of the, I feel like a lot of the, the discourse, environmental discourse has been cheapened in a way over the years by, um, you know, a certain kind of activist preaching for optimism and as a way to motivate people to act and a certain kind of activist preaching pessimism to scare people into action. And, and so I feel like that whole, uh, that whole discourse, I try to have, have sidestep uh, at least. Um, but, you know, on a personal level, I, I am optimistic about the rate of change that we're seeing now in um, culturally um, and politically, really, um, we are seeing a pretty profound shift. I mean, we're not nearly far enough along in this shift, but if you look at um, just the way that climate, for instance, was prioritized um, in the Biden campaign or now in the presidency, just compared to under Obama, for instance, um, it's a pretty radical difference um, and, and advancement. And you know, the pessimism, of course, is just, you know, if you just look at the parts per million CO2, or you, you look at any of these, these, you know, horrific escalations of, of environmental catastrophe, um, uh, the sense of being past tipping points, um, which I feel, of course, living in, in Southern Louisiana, um, it's hard not to despair, but I, I also feel that, um, you know, it's 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 not a que it's not a binary situation that we're in. Um, that this is the fight of our species. That this is a fight that will be going on for the rest of our lives and beyond. And um, there's still a wide range. You know, even if the best case scenario is not something that we would have ever wanted, um, you know, decades ago, uh, it's still better than the worst. You know, the, the worst case scenarios, and we still have a lot of agency in controlling um, the outcomes there. And I think what's more interesting to me is is the questions about well, as we start to take action, as we start to take transformative action, um, dramatic at a dramatic scale, uh, how you know how how are we going to be guided? Um, you know, what are the values that are going to guide us? Um, what where are we going to um, put our energies, and how are we going to resolve some of these moral crises that will be created by by our actions and um, that story for me is sort of more interesting than um, this sort of optimism, pessimism. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Nathaniel. And uh, I think we're at the end of our time here now. So let me just say to everyone who's here and who's been listening, thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your questions. And you must go out and buy this book from Politics and Prose. Uh, it's a wonderful book. You really need to read it. It's a very important, urgent book for our times. And thank you for writing it, Nathaniel. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here with me. It's a, it's a thrill, as always, to, to speak with you. And, um, and thank you, Politics and Prose, for being such a great institution and supportive to writers and independent thinkers. Absolutely. Yeah. I really couldn't have said it better myself. Many thanks to Nathaniel Rich, Amitav Ghosh, and our audience out there tuning in and engaging with this discussion. Your patronage and dedication enable us to keep bringing you this amazing programming, and we simply couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So go ahead and follow the link in the chat to purchase your copy of Second Nature, Scenes from a World Remade, 
or just hop on over to politics-pros.com. While you're there, you can check out our event calendar to see what else we've got coming up. And from our shelves to yours, we hope you're out there staying safe, staying strong, and of course, staying well-read. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.